yes, I am. I just had to unmute myself and, you know, click, click all the right little boxes. Sorry. <laughs> um, okay. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you an introduction to the Einstein toolkit. It's going to be uh, possibly a bit more lighthearted than many of the talks that you've had today and a little bit more lower level, but it is intended to be an introduction for new students. Um, if you have uh, attended Einstein toolkit workshops before, you have seen this talk before. Um, so uh, this talk is based on uh, some educational materials that we've just sort of put together. No. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, um, <laughs> okay. So 1.3 billion years ago, two black holes, each about 30 solar masses collided. They released three solar masses worth of mass energy as gravitational waves. Earth was, when it was in the Proterozoic Aeon. Life consists of eukaryotes, including multicellular life forms. Steve, I apologize for the interruption. Your voice is coming in and out, fading in and out, as if there was is something it? wrong with your mic. <clears throat> Uh, I'm not aware of anything wrong with my mind. Hold on, let me let me try my, making an adjustment. All right. Let me know if the problem persists. Okay, so 540 million years. 541 million years ago, the Phanerozoic eon begins, and complex life, including vertebrates, appeared. One million years ago, Neanderthals appeared. 200,000 years ago, anatomically modern humans appeared. In 1687, Newton published Philosophe Naturalis Principia Mathematica. In 1905, Einstein published his paper on special relativity. In 1915, Einstein published his papers on general relativity. In 1916, Schwarzschild published the Schwarzschild black hole solution. In 1936, Einstein correctly described gravitational waves. You notice how, how long it took between his initial theory and this moment. In 1956, Felix Perani eliminates co coordinate confusion and describes gravitational waves using curvature. In 1963, like 50 years after the original uh, Einstein equations, uh, Kerr published the Kerr black hole solution describing rotating black holes. In 1994, the head-on collision of two black holes was simulated as well as distorted single black holes. In 1995, distorted Kerr solutions were simulated by me when I was a graduate student. In 1997, Cactus was created by Paul Walker and Joanne Masseau. It remains uh, one of the best completely open source collaborative frameworks for studying numerical relativity. In 2005, Franz Pretorius published his results on evolving binary black hole spacetimes. In 2012, the Einstein toolkit was created. In 2015, LIGO detected gravitational waves from two black holes that collided 1.3 billion years ago. The event was called GW150914. Uh, here's a quote from David Bowie. Oh man, look at those cavemen go. So there you see two black holes colliding in the distance behind the Tesla Roadster. So I, I just thought I'd, I'd show you this, this brief little synopsis because it's really been quite astounding, at least for me in my lifetime, you know, as a graduate student, when many of these waveforms uh, were just uh, writings on a blackboard, you know, and to eventually watch all the steps come together over the years and finally, you know, see the detection. It's, it's really quite um, awe-inspiring. And I'm, I kind of hope that that little intro gives you a flavor of how awe-inspiring inspiring this 1.3 billion year journey has been. Okay, so uh, here is the uh, Einstein tool toolkit, which, as I said, uh, has existed since 2012. It's a collection of scientific software components and tools to simulate and analyze general relativistic and astrophysical systems. It's freely available. It's supported by a number of grants and has been over the years. Um, it is intended to be a sta state of the art set of tools for numerical relativity and as always open source. Um, 
I didn't update the number of members from sites and countries. Uh, I, you can see that on the website that is updated live. Um, and countless publications and theses have built on this. I mean, the, the latest number I have here is from 2013. It's possible Roland has a newer number. Um, it's based on regular tested releases. So I've worked on a number of software projects over the years, and few of them take the time to uh, construct rigorous test suites on the level of the Einstein toolkit. Um, so that's, that's uh, a nice feature. We have user support through various channels. The primary one is, is the user's mailing list. Um, below, you can see the people who are currently the official members of the Einstein Toolkit uh, organizing, organization. Um, and we're always looking for more. So you could imagine your face there at some point in the future. All right. So what, is, what does the Einstein Toolkit do? Uh, it, it does a lot of astrophysical science. It does black hole mergers, neutron star mergers, supernova, accretion disks, uh, boson stars, hairy black holes, uh, cosmic censorship. These, these are all questions that people have explored uh, with the toolkit. And it's not, it's not even uh, the limit of what, what's there. So the idea behind the toolkit is it is to be a community effort. And the reason why is because we have many challenges, right? Computational challenges first among them. Um, and some of us may feel like this gorilla in this picture when, when, it, when attempting to approach, approach these complex scientific questions. Again, just a, a reminder of how far we've come with our computational equipment um, and the way it's continued to evolve. And this sort of presents a problem. Uh, this is the, well, this presents a problem because, right, we have to constantly adapt to new things to, to get the, the same results or to improve on our results or just to keep going. This is Fugaku, which is the uh, which is the current number one supercomputer in the world, and um, this is a Borg spaceship. <laughs> so I, I just kind of struck me how similar the color scheme and everything was. I wonder if Fugaku was inspired by that. All right, so computational challenges. Uh, so we want to simulate cutting edge science. We want to use the latest numerical methods. We want to make use of the latest hardware, which includes things like the cache. Uh, we want to have, make use of vector instructions. We want to be able to scale to many cores. We want to scale to many nodes. Um, we want to use the newest algorithms. Very often, um, algorithms are a more important uh, component in advancing numerical science than, than any of the things that have gone before that on this list. So it's uh, the, deficient, the efficient design of all the hardware is complex and tedious, and um, it, it requires experts from different disciplines, people with different levels of inspiration. It requires good data layouts and APIs uh, to ensure correctness. Uh, good, good modularization is required. Um, and a number of levels of understanding of advanced comp programming con concepts are required. And the design and implementation needs to be carefully thought out in order to ensure extensibility and portability. And that's largely, a lot of these things are given to us by the Cactus framework. Um, and one of the things that the Cactus framework does for the scientist, right, is it allows the scientist to organize their computation into logical boxes. And one of the ways that that, that is enabled is through the concept of ghost zones. Um, it may be that everybody on the call is familiar with ghost zones. I'm not sure, but I will just go over it briefly. Um, the concept is we are updating equations on grids. And sometimes these equations are based on derivatives. And these derivatives uh, are, are replaced by instead finite differences. So Finite differences in call re require getting uh, data from adjacent grids. Now, if you spread your grid across different processors, then you need to do communication, explicit communication to exchange those ghost zones in between your time steps of your grid to keep your data moving forward in time and consistent. Um, and so the idea is you compute everything here and then you send, you send this data point over and it lands on this uh, 
position on, on, on the other processor. And this pro and processor one will compute this data and take this X here and send it over to processor zero where it becomes the boundary. And then processor zero can evolve forward on this point and processor one can evolve forward on this point. Now, as such, this is just, you know, if you just took a, a large rectangular region and chopped it up into boxes, this is relatively straightforward if painful to program and Cactus will abstract that. Um, and sort of another picture of it, it looks like this. So we, if, you, if you think of your, if you were to do a two dimensional equation, you, you could chop it up into four and the ghost zones are the dotted lines. On the other hand, you could chop it up this way. So while this does not look like a, lo a lot of boxes at first glance, it actually is. Um, we have things that are obviously boxes in the center and we have uh, other boxes. So we have this purple grid here is logically a box, right? It has got an X and a Y coordinate. And as far as any code that the scientist, scientist is writing, um, it looks like a box, okay? Any of these grids look like a box. And what, what um, Cactus allows you to do is it allows you to write code for how you update a grid on a box, but Cactus itself organizes the boxes for you and into this shape, uh, which includes, you know, different grids and in, it includes uh, adaptive mesh refinement, which you've heard some discussion of just recently. Okay, so how do we address some of these computational challenges that we met before? So with vector intrinsics, we uh, sometimes the Einstein equations are too complex um, for, com for compilers. They sometimes uh, give up, even though the, the task is in principle relatively straightforward. So we have tools such as Crank and NERPI, which will generate vectorized code for us, when the, uh, which often works when the compilers are unable to do it. Um, scaling to many cores in the Cactus framework has typically been done with OpenMP, uh, although with the, ad, the inclusion of AMREX in, the, um, in our framework, it may be done by tiling and uh, hidden from the programmer. Scaling to many cores is done, by, is done using MPI, and that is handled by Carpet or in the future Carpet X, which will be based on AMREX. Um, Algorithms uh, such as adaptive mesh refinement uh, are kept hidden by the framework. Also method of lines, which involves various time stepping things. So one of the things that graduate students typically find themselves doing when they're trying to write numerical software is recoding uh, Runge-Kutta algorithms and the like. And there's no need for doing that. Uh, in the Einstein toolkit, you can tell the toolkit how to, comp how to compute a right-hand side and it can call that right-hand side code multiple times to generate the, the correct result. Uh, making use of the GPU is something that we have struggled to do uh, along with many others and Carpet X should make that possible. Uh, I don't know what's in the future. You know, you could imagine all sorts of things. I don't really believe that we're gonna use neuromorphic processors or, or, or um, qubits when we uh, code the Einstein toolkit, but uh, the future, the point is the future is is unknown. It's going to bring us new challenges. It's going to take us in different directions than we expect. And it will always be a challenge keeping the computational framework up to date with those things. But that's what the toolkit is here for, so that you have a community to do that. Um, in addition, when you write code, there are more mundane challenges, right? In, you have efficient I.O., which is, you know, I.O. Is, is probably the bottleneck to most to most codes. Uh, Seymour Cray used to say that a uh, supercomputer is a device that takes a computationally bound problem and turns it into an I.O. bound problem. Um, but in any event, time and effort needs to be put into efficient I.O. Uh, if you're going to get any mileage out of your simulation. Uh, HDF5 uh, interface, you want an HDF5 interface, hierarchical data format five. It's a portable data, data format that is used, widely used in uh, science. And you wanna make sure you use that and not some custom you know, uh, ASCII format most of the time because of efficiency reasons and uh, speed reasons. Uh, you want the ability to checkpoint and restart your simulation. If you're going to run a large simulation on a modern supercomputing, 
supercomputer. You cannot count on being able to run this simulation from start to finish without interruption. Uh, for any serious scientific code, checkpoint restart capability is required. Parameter parsing, it's a simple thing. It's, um, you know, but it's just one more thing that you have to do if you're writing a code from scratch. And, it, and one more thing you don't have to do if you're using a framework. Uh, visualization, it's, uh, you can't do much with your data if you can't visualize it. And so you need to have a community that's put some effort into figuring out how to, how to display data. Um, steering, so it may be that your uh, computation needs to be, needs babysitting. It needs somebody to watch what it's doing and maybe change parameters during the run. That's possible with uh, the Cactus framework, although I haven't heard of anyone doing it in a while. Um, but in addition to these, you know, uh, technical challenges and these mundane challenges, there are also collaborative challenges because sometimes scientists collaborate much in the way these, these two gorillas are doing. Um, so we have a problem, right? Einstein, Einstein's equations, and we have different groups in different parts of the country doing different things that, that are working on that problem. And we have a uh, computation that we try to apply to understand that problem. And we have a community uh, that, that does computation and other things trying to work on that problem. And we have many ways of communicating, you know, phone calls or Zoom calls or web pages or email um, or Git or you know, various other repositories, subversion and, and other things have sort of fallen by the wayside. Uh, there are various tools for bug tracking and, and uh, we still use MediaWiki. We have workshops like this one. You know, there, there are ways that we need, we need to make connections with, you, with each other if we're gonna keep this going and make progress. So we have problems and we have different groups working on them. We have competition between those groups. And this was understood by Cactus from the beginning, right? We wanted a way for, for competing groups to uh, both share and keep some things for themselves. Uh, so the Cactus framework is designed with that in mind. So there's competition and then there's standards. We have you know, uh, common ways of writing grid functions and various things inside the toolkit so that we are able to, to do things like make make reuse of method of line algorithms or, or such on, on new codes. Um, NHDF5 is another sort of standard uh, piece of, it's a standard data format that many groups use. Okay, and then we have a bunch of different languages that we want to use. It was always sort of a vision of Cactus that it would incorporate, incorporate different languages, but we seem to have uh, been happy with C++, C, and Fortran so far. In the future, we might, we might incorporate some other language, Rust, I don't know. Okay, and then the idea is we want to give credit. So we, we have, uh, we do, we make an effort in this community to try to give people credit for the things that they've done and encourage people to make citations that, that give appropriate credit for the toolkit, for the thorns that it uses, and for the people who work on it. Um, and credits go to groups as well as individuals. And here are some of the groups that are working together. We've got people in Louisiana, Illinois, Virginia, Pennsylvania, Georgia, California. We have researchers in other countries, in Italy, Spain, Portugal, Canada, and Germany. Um, you'll hear from, from some of these people today, or if you haven't already. Uh, the Einstein toolkit has goals. It has to be community driven. It's a core computational for, tool for GR, but it is a general purpose, purpose tool as well. I have involved water waves with it, as have other people. Um, the components are cactus, which is sort of the core, the flesh, the, the, the glue, which holds everything together. There's Sim Factory, which allows us to compile and run the code in a more convenient way. There's Crank and NERP Plus, which allow us to do, to go from mathematical equations to, uh, to actual code. And there's a large variety of science modules. We have guiding principles of being open, community driven, having good interfaces, keeping a separation of physics from computational architecture and doing code reviews. Um, okay, so the Cactus, the Einstein Toolkit started out uh, small as a growing project with Cactus and some other modules. And uh, over time, people have added to it. 
and most of the modules are open source, not necessarily all. Some modules we advertise, some we don't, we barely know what they do. But, um, you know, the, the idea is we've made a, the, the Einstein toolkit is a, is a framework that allows people to work together on codes more easily. So we have base modules that solve the Einstein equations with, you know, some modules for the space-time curvature um, and for the matter components. And the matter components have diverse pieces, right? You know, hydrodynamics, magnet electromagnetism, particle radiation. And we have uh, thorns such as ADM base, Team UNU base, MLB SSN, which makes use of both of them. We have Hydro base, which also makes use of both of them. We have GR Hydro, and so on, with the dependencies as you, as you see them on the screen there. Um, and we have initial data and analysis thorns that that make use of those things as well. Okay. So. Uh, again, you know, these are our guiding principles. Doing science is more than just running a simulation, but student and students need to know a lot about physics, uh, but before before they can really do anything. But it's it's helpful, and, and the Einstein toolkit can't give that. But open codes uh, that are easy to use allow new students to concentrate on those things more on the physics, less on the computer science, and that's what we're seeking. Um, if you want to cite the Einstein toolkit, uh, you aren't required to do so. Um, nothing, you know, but it would be nice. And currently we are advocating a DOI, uh, digital object identifier, that you can cite to uh, in your papers or your research. You could also cite the original Einstein toolkit or other cactus papers. Um, there are some papers that are uh, specific to components that you might use. It's just good manners, um, and uh, and your having a long, longer citation list on your paper makes you look smarter. So, please do it. <laughs> All right. So um, here is our vision for the future. We've got a new driver thorn that's that you have heard about and will be hearing about at, based on Amrex. Uh, we have a new declarative synchronization presync, which is still not quite where we want it to be. Uh, we have new spherical coordinate thorns from RIT, which you will hear about. Uh, and we have the new Python code generator, uh, NERPI Plus. Um, recent new thorns include Praca, Lean, and Giraffe. So here is our summary. There's our website. Uh, please visit it. That's your one-stop shop for all the in information about the toolkit. Um, and it's open site open source, it's worldwide, it's a worldwide open research community and it's used in a lot of high end research. It's supported by these grants and has been supported by these grants over the years, mostly through the National Science Foundation. So that takes me to the end of the, the, uh, the high level uh, lighthearted presentation. The next section will be on the uh, toolkit itself and the making use of the toolkit itself. And I thought I'd pause to answer any questions at this point, if there are any. Um, whoever our moderator is, I hope, that you will read questions to me rather than counting on me, like seeing things in the chat. So far, no questions. Okay, great. Okay, so uh, what I've done here is first I've logged into the Einstein Toolkit website, which is uh, etk1.ccc.lsu.edu. You need an HTTPS in front of that. Um, if, is there anybody who has had trouble logging into the website used for this course? So um, this website is uh, a similar version to the one that we normally maintain for doing regular tutorials. Uh, the difference here is the uh, couple of things. First, the, the way that you log into it, and second, the amount of computer power that's behind it. This one, this particular instance of the tutorial has 48 cores and a lot of memory, 
And so it should be able to handle a large number of people doing things at once without feeling too much pain. Um, I see the number of messages in the chat has increased. If, if there are questions, I guess I'll know. Yeah, so I just uh, posted the website and the code again uh, for users who uh, haven't tested that this morning. Okay, all right. So um, I'm going to, to walk through this tutorial now and I want you all to let me know if you've got questions uh, at any point and if you don't make if you don't ask a question now there will be there will be opportunities in the mornings of the uh, succeeding days of this workshop as well as after the workshop by email or other things um, and the point is we want to make sure that that uh, you're able to get up and running with cactus without with with the Einstein toolkit with a minimum of pain okay so let's go over to the notebook. So what I've selected from this list, so let me back up a minute. This is, the, our tutorial system is based on Jupyter Notebooks, which are sort of a, an intermediate thing between a terminal and a GUI, right? So instead of just a graphical user interface that you have to learn all the, the different knobs and pieces to, to, to turn to make things work, um, we retain the, sort of sanity of a command line, but we also get the benefits of some graphical interactions. So in this case, we, what we see is a, a picture of the file system. We're choosing a particular notebook called the Cactus Tutorial. And this has a lot of information about uh, how, to, how to get the prerequisites for the Einstein Toolkit ins installed. It does require a, a number of different software packages to be in place. Um, ideally, you should be running in a Linux or Mac environment. If you're using Windows, you can use the WSL, the Windows subsystem for Linux, which makes Windows into kind of a Linux computer. And uh, those are the details that you would need if you were setting it up directly on your laptop rather than in this special notebook environment where we've got everything arranged for you. Now, one of the nice things about notebooks is you can see everything you've done, right? So you have a cell in your notebook, which is computation. And when you click on that cell and hit shift enter, then uh, all the stuff, all the code in the cell executes. Now the code in the cells is by default Python, but Python can do a number of tricks. So in particular, there is this register cell magic here. Can you, can you make your window full screen and then zoom in a little bit kind of waste yes space yes um, here we go better yes thank you all right so in particular uh this 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 code enables us to use percent percent bash as a command which will um enable us to write bash commands directly in the cell and we see the the output of the cell below the cell after it executes um, there are a number of different pieces in here. These are variables that are important for running uh, open, MP, open MPI jobs uh, when you're trying to share with other systems. Although we have since switched this tutorial to uh, MPitch, which doesn't ha seem to have this issue as much. Um, this import scroll down is, is a package that's used to make the output of the uh, notebook a little more convenient. Um, when you have long output, the notebook by default doesn't scroll down to the bottom. This allows it to do that automatically. Okay, the next point is we're going to have an optimized build experience. Now, in the past, we have always downloaded and compiled the whole Einstein toolkit, or at least a, a piece of it, and that turns out to take just too long. Um, there's, al there's always been a part in the tutorial where we get bogged down with waiting for everybody to compile their code. And then the presenter has to, you know, do a tap dance routine or something to occupy the time. So in this case, what we're gonna do is we're gonna start with a pre-compiled Einstein toolkit in our directory. And even with that in place, all the steps for downloading and installing the toolkit still do something and we can still execute them. They just, they just happen orders of magnitude faster. So I'm gonna do that, all right? I'm going to, uh, and this is doing an RM minus FR cactus. I'm not sure, I, 
I didn't intend to put that in everybody's notebook. I might have made that edit to my own. Um, if if you want to comment that out, you can you can do that with a with a hash, right? Since that's Python syntax. Um, if you don't know how to program Python, that really shouldn't be too much of a problem for this tutorial, uh, or for your use of the Einstein toolkit in general. Okay, now it shows a star here while it's executing. So it does take some time to both remove this directory and to uh, unpack this tarball. And after it finishes, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, change directory into the root of our working tree. And we're going to call get components. Uh, this is so get components is a way to check out from a number of different repositories as part of the same installation. Remember, I told you that Cactus was collaborative or Einstein Toolkit was collaborative. And part of that uh, collaboration means that we don't just do things from one repository. And maybe, you know, the repository is located, the repositories that build your Einstein Toolkit instance um, are maintained by institutions in other countries or, or other states or whatever. The point is, um, we don't have just one thing that checks out that is controlled by one group. The, the notion is to enable uh, groups to work together and to be their own bosses and to decentralize control of everything as much as possible. Why is this taking this long? So in the past, when I've run this, of course, it hasn't taken that long. Um, but I, I am currently uh, competing against other people who are doing the same thing, of course. And OK, so the load is finally finished. And now I've uh, changed directory into my home directory. And now from this point, what I'm going to do is I'm going to check out the toolkit. Okay, so this is this is using get components to uh, well, this is getting this is fetching the get components command, which is written in Perl. Okay. Uh, next, what I'm going to do is I'm going to invoke get components in parallel to uh, grab the files in the Einstein toolkit thorn list. Okay, so the idea behind Cactus, uh, the base infrastructure that the Einstein Toolkit is based on, is that cactuses have thorns, right? And so that, that's the metaphor that we're using. And each thorn is a module, and, the, and then there's the flesh, which is sort of the central piece. Unfortunately, we are not biologists. It turns out that cactuses do not have thorns. They have spines, but we're stuck with the terminology anyway. Okay, so the next step is we're going, to, we've got a, this, uh, this procedure here would, should create a cactus directory for us, and we will go into that directory. Okay, and now we're going to uh, configure our sim factory. So sim factory, I told you before, is a tool that um, allows us to simplify the building and running of cactus. But it needs a, a setup step, it needs to, to take a look at the machine that that you're on and, and fill in some defaults and, and some variables about the machine size and capabilities and so on. So we're going to run sim factory setup silent, which is the way people normally configure sim factory. And it sets up my machine. In this case, uh, this is the machine and it, it generates um, a file describing that machine. Okay, so now we're going to build the Einstein toolkit. So we're going to call sim factory with build. We're going to tell it to use two threads to build it. And we need to supply the thorn list, that thing that we use uh, that we use get components to to uh, download. And this thorn list describes all the thorns that we are going to use in our computation. Now the Einstein toolkit release comes with a set of thorns that uh, we are we call standard and which we think that most people want to use. But the idea behind the list is that you can freely edit it or create thorn lists of your own and share them around. So let's build this.
Now, I promised you it would still do something, uh, even though it had a completely pre-built cactus. And you can see uh, it is indeed spitting text type. Um, in the process of building itself, cactus, uh, cactus will locate your MPI. Ideally, you want to have your MPIC, MPICC or MPIC++ command in your path because Cactus is going to use that. Uh, you want to, it's also a good idea to make sure that uh, you keep that setting the same when you compile and run it, run Cactus, because uh, if you compile with one MPI and try to run with a different MPI, that tends not to work out well. You may notice that, okay, so we've scrolled to the bottom and you can see this little scroll bar here is, is where it belongs. Should you wish to scroll up, uh, all you need to do is uncheck this bo box and now you are free to move this to somewhere other than the end, right? You can look all through this output and see everything that the cactus does in the process of its compilation. Now, normally in an unloaded machine, this would already be completely finished, but um, as it is, I can see there are tons of people doing things in my other window over here where I'm running top. There are people running simulations already. There are people who are compiling. All sorts of things are going on. The machine should be able to handle it. It shouldn't be too painful, but uh, it, there is some pain. Okay, so once this finishes, we'll be able to run our first cactus simulation. Uh, this would be a good point if anybody has any questions about anything I've said, uh, to ask them. Here's a question in the chat. Um, the question is, is there a log file uh, where you can check the build output? Not now, of course, but when we will do this on, say, our own machines. So by default, uh, the build does not create a log. I usually pipe everything through T, the T command, right? If you're familiar with that, T-E-E -E on Linux. So you can type something of the order. I'll just sort of put it here. This is the way I, I often do it, right? So this sends standard error into standard out. And then this pipe command sends, it, sends this through T. And what the T command does is it sends a copy of the output to make that out. And it also, it also sends a copy to the screen. Um, so I, I normally build that way uh, just, to, just to have a log. If you're working in a notebook, however, this kind of thing is unnecessary because the notebook itself maintains that for you. Another question? Um, there's one uh, about uh, Xcode. Uh, so do we need Xcode or is it optional? If you're running on Mac, you will uh, need Xcode. Yeah, I think we discuss the requirements for Mac up here. So we suggest that you install X, Xcode from the App Store and, and follow the instructions here. And Macs, are, Macs can be tricky, and if you have trouble, uh, please contact our mailing list or well, during the tutorial, you can contact, say, the Gitter chat room, um, and afterwards, you can contact the mailing list. Okay, so... There there's, seems to be someone's getting a fatal error. Uh, let me look at the, see if I can see the chat. So uh, the person who got the fatal error, what were you doing at the time the error occurred? Were you compiling? Were you uh, running the code? What were you doing? Ah, okay, all right. So it, it, it may be that, that the RM broke things for you. Five minutes. Okay, five minutes. Um, so I'm running out of time. Uh, I'm going to 
execute this. I don't know if you'll see it run, but if you do, you'll see hello world. Then I'm going to run a single neutron star simulation. This is what we call a parameter file. It's mostly name equal value kind of things. Um, <clears throat> there are lots of fairly intuitive things like cactus terminate. This says, you know, the simulation ends when you reach a certain simulation time. This tells you the time that you want the, the, the simulation to end. <clears throat> there are other ways that you can do it. Uh, you can describe this. This helps you describe the coordinate system. So we want X, Y, and Z to go from zero to 24 with DX, DY, and DZ on the order of two. Well, equal to two. Um, there are a number of, of different uh, things that you want to set in that in that way, right? This is a TOV star that we're describing. We're, we're describing the uh, the setup for the for the hydro and all the initial conditions and so on. Okay, so what what this what this cell is going to do when we execute it is it's going to write out this file, um, the little percent. Um, yeah, this percent bash is going to cause that to write out. <coughs> then we're going to um, this will this will create the simulation. It won't execute it. Um, I often remove any old simulation that's already there beforehand, and then this should submit the job. Uh, and if you are on a cluster, that will submit it to the batch queue. If you are on your laptop or a desk workstation, which doesn't have a batch queue, it will simply run in the background. Um, you can list the simulation. This will call, call show you that hopefully that it's running. Um, and then you can pr press this, which will follow the simulation as it runs live. Um, you can also list all simulations. If we had gotten to this point in the code, uh, you would see both hello and the TOV star in the list. If you want to stop a simulation for some reason, you can do that. We have that commented out so that you don't do that by mistake. And this is somewhat uh, similar to doing the RM minus FR. All right, the next piece that, that uh, I had hoped to show you, but I don't think I'll get to, is that you can plot uh, data in the output and you can run this on your own. The point is because this is a Jupyter notebook, we can do plotting in line and it will be saved along with uh, all our results, our computation, uh, our, our, our compilation, our setup, our computation, everything. Two minutes. And this means that um, you have a, this means that you have a, a way to keep track of everything that you've done and look over it again and maybe tweak your procedure and experiment with it. But what we've given you here is a recipe that you can just click cell after cell and it should all work as advertised. Um, and then, you know, you can start on your own to diverge from this in various ways, like installing on your own laptop, uh, running your own simulations with your own parameters um, and so on. Are there any questions? Well, it may be that you encounter questions uh, later on after you have a chance to get to the far enough in, in the tutorial. And uh, we will be around during the workshop hours uh, as listed One by, minute. by Roland. And uh, we can give you help you know, with fatal errors or other kinds of problems that you encounter. So I think that takes me to the end of my final minute. Um, again, any, any final questions? <laughs> 30 seconds. There is a question. There is a question in the chat. How do you decide which thorns to include in this simulation? Right. So the thorns that you're going to use in the simulation depend on what you want to do, right? Uh, so typically, Nobody writes a thorn list from scratch. They take an existing thorn list and they modify it. So here I've given you a TOV star, for example. And if you wanted to run the TOV star for a longer time, you could, you could change the time parameter. If you wanted to run it at higher resolution, you could change the DT to make it smaller, the DX, DY, and DZ to make them smaller, and so on. 
um, the you could change the 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 ODE method, the method that, that's used to evolve it. You could change the the, uh, the DT fact, right? So this is going to 0.25 is going to multiply uh, to give you your current condition. You could experiment with different values of that. Um, there are, yes. Oh no, sorry. Go ahead. I, I I'll ask the question later. Yeah. So I'm just. This is how you and and if you want to do something different that that you know this system doesn't doesn't uh, describe for you. If you want, say, black hole initial data, you could bring in, you know, two puncture, for example, uh, instead. And maybe you would get rid of some of these team unithorns uh, or, or, or the other things relating to hydro, right? So that's basically, you, you decide which thorns to include based on your science. And you usually start with, with some previous thorn list and make modifications, or I'm sorry, parameter list. <laughs> Next question. Um, yeah, how how do we know which um, um, which inputs are allowed? Um, look, so let's say ah. when you uh, so for the for the evolution uh, scheme, uh, you had uh, as an example, you had RK four. What if I wanted to use like uh, something like some Adam Bash four or something else? Uh, right. how, how would I know what to so, type and what's you know what's allowed to to be typed? So if you, so when you, at the conclusion of this compilation phase, what you get is a cactus executable, say uh, dot slash exe slash cactus underscore sim. And what that's going to, and if you run that without any arguments, uh, you, well, if you run that with like, uh, with, with minus H, it'll tell you what you, what you need to do to see the parameters. And if you ask it, and if you give it the right flag, I forget what they are, but the minus H, the help flag will show you. Um, if you, it will print out all the parameters that are in all the thorns that you've compiled and what the allowed values are. Um, in addition, if you know how to, to read uh, a cactus param.ccl, you can go hunting for those through the source code. And I think that uh, later in, in this week, you will get a, a thorn writing tutorial, which will explain the param ccl files uh, to you and how to, how to read those. But Either way, you can either ask the executable directly or you can ask the thorn list. It will, it will show you all the, the parameters and the Sounds possible good. values. Sounds good, thank you.